Jesus is our brand, and so truth is our brand. How do we know what truth is? We study the Bible, we think, we preach, we teach. Great Controversy 297, Christians should stand ready to accept all the light which may shine from God's holy word. We preach and teach in groups. We gather to preach and teach. When we gather, we listen, and when we listen, we're listening to a presenter. To broaden our understanding of a topic, we often bring in guest speakers. We want to hear different viewpoints from people who are experienced Christians and have a depth of knowledge in and are drawing from the scriptures. By listening to a variety of voices, we seek to correct any bias we might be having. Now, I want you to consider the experience of a fellow named William Miller. Listen to this, Great Controversy, page 320, 321. As his work tended to build up the churches, it was for a time regarded with favor, but as ministers and religious leaders decided against the Advent doctrine and desired to suppress all agitation of the subject, they not only opposed it from the pulpit, but denied their members the privilege of attending preaching upon the Second Advent or even of speaking of their hope in the social meetings of the church. Thus, the believers found themselves in a position of great trial and perplexity. They loved their churches and were loath to separate from them, but as they saw the testimony of God's word suppressed and their right to investigate the prophecies denied, they felt that loyalty to God forbade them to submit. Those who sought to shut out the testimony of God's word, they could not regard as constituting the church of Christ, the pillar and ground of the truth. Hence, they felt themselves justified in separating from their former connection. In the summer of 1844, about 50,000 withdrew from the churches. William Miller, a Baptist, he was a sought-for presenter. He preached thousands and thousands of times as a guest speaker. God uses many different persons to share his truth. Now, Miller's preaching was eventually suppressed. By suppressing a speaker, one suppresses the message of the speaker. What we would today call Miller's uh, seminar presentations spread important biblical insight all across the northeastern seaboard of the United States. I mean, he really got around until, that is, until he was suppressed. We should be alert and interested anytime we come across this desire to suppress information. A chief characteristic of the papacy was that it suppressed information. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth that is not intended to be an agency for the suppression of truth. Now, a change with enormous implications was introduced into this uh, new church manual. This change seems to grant veto power to conferences over guest speakers that local churches might wish to invite. And although there were uh, intelligent and impassioned uh, warnings against making this change, this was adopted into the church manual last year in 2022 and became a part of the new, the new manual. Now, the chief changes are worded this way. Page 126, the local elders or church board may also invite speakers in consultation with the pastor and in harmony with the conference guidelines. And then over on page 35, this change, no one should be allowed to speak to any congregation unless he or she has been invited by the church in harmony with the guidelines given by the conference. Now, these changes and the way in which they are now being em employed signal a new denial to church members of the privilege of attending preaching. By removing the liberty of local church congregations and members to hear for themselves in the churches where they hold membership, Bible messages which contradict preferred opinions. Now, as one who's been continuously employed in pastoral ministry since 1994 as a minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I can describe to you how things work. Now, normally the pastor of a congregation has charge over the preaching schedule. Page 33 here, the pastor, with the assistance of the elders, is expected to plan for and lead out in all spiritual services, such as Sabbath morning worship and prayer meeting, and should officiate at the communion service and baptism. Now, a pastor is often assigned to serve a district of churches, a grouping of churches. He may be responsible for serving two or four or even more congregations in his district. And I want you to know that it's very common for pastors to have the head elders of their churches to arrange the preaching schedule, especially on the Sabbaths in which they're not normally there. Many times your elder will uh, call the people and, and uh, line it all up and schedule it and everything. So in any given, let's say a four church district somewhere, it's very likely, it's, it's very common that three out of those four churches 
where there's a speaker presenting, those have been assigned not by the pastor, but by the local church elders. The conferences usually make available to pastors a list, a list of possible guest speakers, and it will include uh, conference people, it'll include lay people, and it'll include retired ministers, people who the conference think will provide a good, solid message for churches. I want you to know, though, these lists have never been understood as designating like the only people that you could call to preach. In fact, only usually a few, a very few of the names on the list are close enough to you that they could possibly ser uh, serve and preach. And they may be serving, oftentimes they're very tied up in their own local congregations, which is natural. You can understand that. I want you to know that it's very rare that a pastor could populate the pulpits of his churches with substantial spiritual presentation sermons uh, if he just relied on a list like that. It doesn't happen anywhere that I've ever heard of. Really, it's the pastor along with his own elders and his own lay people and other uh, key lay people and, and people available in the district that he can get to preach. That's the way it really works. He has to have the help of lay people, elders, and so on, and he has to have the help of, of from occasionally, from guest speakers. Now, Seventh-day Adventists also believe that church members are all part of what we would call a priesthood of believers. We believe that God works through the Holy Spirit with every single member. Some serve in one office, some serve in another, but all members are priests. All have a direct line to God. They pray to him. They receive grace from him. They receive help from him. They encourage each other. They strengthen each other. And they labor to build up their church. God gives to every member spiritual gifts to build up the church. There are serious people in a congregation who want it to be built up. So we unite in prayer and worship and fellowship. And I want you to know also, we unite in church governance. Some of the authority the Father gives to Jesus, Matthew 28, that authority is passed on to the membership. The authority rests in the membership. All members, all believers are watchmen on the wall. Isaiah 62 tells us this. From the membership of the individual and the local church, authority that Jesus has given some of that authority to them, some of that authority is distributed onward. And so some are made pastors, some are made presidents, some are made administrators, and they are lent in limited measure some of this authority. Now, this limited flow of authority from the bottom, so to speak, to the top, toward the top of the structure, this in no way undermines the authority that remains there at the root of the structure. The authority is still in the membership, the members of the local church. And this isn't a novel or a new, novel conception. It's not a new idea. And, you know, the same view of authority is enshrined in, for example, the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights and so on, right? The Declaration of Independence recognizes that all people have unremovable rights, rights that are inherent in them. Why do they have those rights? Because they're human. You have these rights because you're human. They can't be negotiated away. They can't be traded away. They can't be conveniently, you know, off offloaded somewhere else. You and I have certain inalienable, unremovable rights. There's a liberty to the, that we have because we are human. We all partake in a fundamental liberty that cannot be negotiated away or auctioned off somewhere. And the Tenth Amendment in the Bill of Rights points out that any authorities that haven't been passed on, like to the United States national government or to the state you live in, any of those authorities remain where you are. They remain in the, in the individual. Rights not lent out in trust to another body are, are retained in the individual. You still have them. And in like manner, if the church body has not lent some of these authorities off to other parts of the church, then they still, then the church membership still has them. Some authority is lent onward to presidents and pastors and representatives. No one will deny that authority has been lent to different leaders in the church to address issues where error, of error that are plain, of course. Nobody disputes that they have that authority. And yet the authority that the membership lends to a conference president, it's not a blank check. It's not a license to strip away other authorities that haven't been lent. Church membership has never lent to church administrators the authority to cancel speakers whose opinions concerning disputed matters they disagree with. Speakers that the administrators would prefer to suppress. Like, you guys don't really need to think about that. Stop thinking about that. Nobody stopped and made these guys the thought police. And unless the membership has intentionally given control over this aspect of things uh, to, the, to, to conference leaders here or there, this authority has never consciously been given to a conference. They didn't ask these people to serve so that they could do their thinking for them, or even to decide what opinions they are allowed to hear in their own churches. Now, recently, there's been a fundamental degradation of the liberties of church members. 
The principle of religious liberty protects not only conscience, but free thought. In the church, we value spirit-led free thought. We encourage it. We don't suppress it. Now, bearing these things in mind, I want to review with you some long-standing wording. Uh, you might see my stack here of different church manuals. Uh, I've got all these, plus some I had to find on PDF, but I've got, I've got 19, all the recent ones. I've got 1951, I've got 1942, I've got, a, uh, and I've got all the way back to the very first church manual of all, the 1931 church manual. There's wording that stayed with the church manual from for 90 years, unchanged, from 1932 until the 2020 edition of the church manual. There's wording that's been there all that time, unchanged. Let me read that wording to you. Here it is, and you'll find it if you have, you don't have it, but if you had the 1932 church manual, this would be on page 168. If you have the 2020 edition, it'll be exactly the same on page 120 and 121. But here it is, unauthorized speakers. Our churches have often been imposed upon by having unworthy persons invited to speak to them. Under no circumstances should a minister, elder, or other church officer invite strangers or any unauthorized persons to take any service or to speak in or take part in a public way in any service or meeting of the church. Sometimes men who have been dropped from the ministry or who have been dismissed from church fellowship in other places or designing persons who have had no connection with the church will appear and with great plausible words gain admittance to our churches. Great care should be exercised to prevent this. Everyone worthy of the confidence of our churches will be able to identify himself by producing proper credentials. All others should be excluded. No deviation from this rule should be permitted. It is the duty of every elder minister and conference president to see that this rule is carried out. Now, here's the changed wording in the 2022 edition. Okay, for 90 years, no changes. Here it is on page 126, 127. Now it says authorized speakers. Only speakers worthy of confidence will be invited to the pulpit by the local church pastor in harmony with guidelines given by the conference. See terms used in the church manual, pages 19 and 20. Local elders or church board may also invite speakers in consultation with the pastor and then in harmony with conference guidelines. Individuals who are no longer members or who are under discipline should not be given access to the pulpit. At times it is acceptable for government officials or civic leaders to address a congregation, but all others should be excluded from the pulpit unless permission is granted by the conference. Every pastor, elder, and conference president must enforce this rule. The result of this change has been the rapid development by some conferences of individualized policies. Now, I want you to consider one conference's guest speaker guideline policy. Now, I've, I've omitted the name of the conference because I'm just using this as an example. But here it is. I'm going to flash it on the screen. Here we go. There are several independent ministries within the North American division and indeed in other territories outside the division. It is essential to understand that there are independent ministries that are adversarial and controversial against the values of the blank conference rather than supportive. There may be instances when the leaders of independent ministries are invited to speak within the territory of the blank conference. We must use caution as we consider inviting the leaders of these independent ministries to speak with the blank conference. Here are some principles to help you guide your congregations when inviting someone as a speaker. A. Are they critical of the Adventist Church as an organization? B. Do they support the return of the tithes and offerings to the local church, or do they encourage the tithes and offerings to be diverted to their ministry? C. Do they support the role of women in ministry and the ordination of women to the gospel ministry? D. What has been the track record of the result of their messages? Does it create division, or does it bring unity? E. Is the message in harmony with the fundamental beliefs of the SDA Church? F. Please remind your members to speak with you first before inviting someone. G, if in doubt, please contact the VP for Pastoral Ministries or the VP for Administration. Now, a friend of mine was recently barred from speaking in this conference that has these guidelines. And he was informed by this conference, the conference in question, that they had, quote, no confidence in his ministry. And as I reviewed these guidelines, I noticed that, yes, he, he is opposed to women's ordination, as the World Church has decided. I mean, three times it's, it's been decided, and each time the answer was basically no, no, and no. So the World Church is at, at the topmost level. The highest voice of the church has, has dealt with this again and again and again. They just keep bringing it back, and it was no every time. I guess the Holy Spirit kind of comes with one opinion. The Holy Spirit doesn't waver and say, well, one time he says yes, and one time he says no. So the World Church has that answer. Well, here's a conference which 
uh, has a different answer. So I wonder what spirit is going on there. So here's a conference with a guest speaker policy, which has decided as a part of its voted policy that it will not uh, permit guest speakers who oppose the ordination of women. Boy, I guess they won't be inviting me anytime soon to that particular conference. So the way it is now, guest speakers from outside that coming from outside that conference who support the World Church position are not allowed to be guest speakers to come from outside that conference and speak in that conference space. Now, besides that, consider the extreme subjectivity of that uh, guideline that says, well, what's the result of their ministry? You know, what if their result is divisive? Is it div division or unity? Well, in this particular space, which is its own unique uh, space, it's carved out its own values. Um, yeah, maybe there would be some disagreement, you know, like you guys are going against what the whole the whole body of the World Church led by the Holy Spirit decided. And uh, so, you know, maybe you guys are out of line, you know, maybe. As I thought about my friend, I realized that this 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 man is an exemplary Christian. He's, he's a brilliant teacher, deep student of the Bible, very articulate, uh, very clear minded, uh, you know, Really, any church would be blessed to have this person engaged in ministry. I mean, he's even put his life into having his own um, special ministry group. I mean, he's really all in for Jesus and for present truth. But he can't come and speak in that conference. So I guess that it will not be a surprise if that speaker, if, if his values, so to speak, which are the values of the world church on this point, sort of don't match the values of this particular conference. But now what? Because we have a disagreement and we're going to not allow him to come and speak? Now let me just throw a couple of bullet point, quick quick observations here, right? So if barring unworthy guest speakers has been such a giant, uh, giant issue for the church, then why was the wording in these church manuals uh, from the very earliest manuals down to the most, the most current manual? Well, now it's changed, but why wasn't it changed for 90 years? Did they just get the wording perfect the first time and it just solved all these problems from the first time? Why did this wording lay dormant for 90 years and then suddenly we have to change it all and, and, and so on? Now here's another question. Is, is this thing a, a rule or is it a guideline? Uh, you know, guidelines don't have penalties attached. Guidelines kind of encourage you to go a certain way. A rule is often has a penalty attached to it. Like if you do this, then, you know, we'll do this. So the conference calls, the, they're called guest speaker, you know, guidelines or conference guidelines. Uh, is it a guideline or is it a rule? One congregation in this particular conference that invited a guest speaker that they said didn't match their guidelines, uh, they were threatened that if you ever do that again, you know, we're basically ready to disband you. Well, be careful with those guidelines. Another, another church in that same uh, conference uh, invited a guest speaker. And what happened there? They were, they were told by the, that they were, their board was dissolved and, and their equipment that they had, they had bought was taken away. The members had access to a six-digit bank account of their donations blocked. I mean, guidelines are rules. And here's another bullet point. It's interesting also that shift from barring unauthorized speakers to shift to only allowing authorized speakers, that is a dramatic, dramatic shift from a list, a partial list of people that are not allowed. They shift to a, a small, tiny list of only certain people who are allowed. I mean, that is that is a movement from a black list basically to a white list. These people can't come, but now you're just saying, well, only these people can come. And if somebody calls and asks, you know, well, can, can brother so-and-so come? Well, let's look, you know, is he on the list? And uh, we have a little list, you know, probably probably not even one page. Yeah, let's see, is he on the list? No, he's not on the list, can't come. That's an immeasurably more restrictive thing to do. Now here's another bullet point. These guest speaker guidelines have been only arbitrarily enforced because they were certainly enforced against my friend, but um, they had other speakers come there that presented on another topic. They had just a, a busload of speakers come presented on another topic, very different from the uh, World Church position on that topic, but they were allowed to do it, even though they didn't meet their own speaker guidelines. But this is this selective enforcement thing. Like, we'll allow this because it goes with our conference values, but we won't allow this because it goes against our conference values. And one more bullet point, and I think maybe this is the most important bullet point of all. For the past 90 years of church governance, we have had basically one uh, church-wide standard. It's in all these it's in all these manuals, the same thing, the same, absolutely the same thing. But now suddenly, the word conference has been dropped in there. Now suddenly, we're going to have all different conferences. Now, there's, there's 59 conferences, I believe, in North America. 
You want 59 distinct, separate, different, unique individual policies. Each conference develops its own policy. This is, this is leading to the fragmentation of unity in the church. You're going to have all different uh, preferences there, and we're only going to allow speakers at our conference that are, you know, fit our little club. We're going from a worldwide standard of what we do and what we don't do to a localized standard of what, you know, what the, the gang that's in charge there permits. So now in 2022, we have this dramatic shift to conference-specific guidelines. Now, although at first blush, it seems like, you know, there really are no guardrails, there's no safeguards, there's no way to tell to help a conference, you know, well, make sure it puts together some good uh, conference guidelines. Actually, there's a very important safeguard and it's right here in the, in the church manual on page 17 and, and 18, even, even in the new one. And I'm gonna read it to you right now. So here's this guideline that is in the church manual, this guardrail, no attempt should be made to set up standards of membership or to make or attempt to enforce rules or regulations for local church operations that are contrary to these decisions adopted by the general conference in session and that are set forth in this church manual. There it is. This measure, the guidelines of that conference, include a provision exactly contradictory to the world church at the question of women's ordination. Therefore, they're null and void. They're in contradiction. Do you know that when that conference sent a letter to my friend and told him they had no confidence in his ministry, they quoted from page 126 in the church manual. They didn't quote from page 17, though, which showed that their quote from 126 was out of order because they, they support the they require the support for the ordination of women. They used the church manual to tell him that he was out of harmony with the church manual when, in fact, he was in harmony with the church manual and they were out of harmony with the church manual. What a pack of interesting people. And whether that was because of audacity or because of, you know, they were missing a brain cell, I don't know. Maybe it was, maybe it was on the audacity range. But their, uh, their objection to him coming was absolutely uh, out of order. So it's null and void. Sorry, guys. Let me share a warning here. Whether all parties involved understand it or not, the new approach reaches out to intercept the authority of Jesus, authority that Jesus has given to the membership, and reset the power so that instead of resting in the membership, it rests in administration. Then it employs this power from above to press down on the members. And it does that to achieve a naked political object. This is pure uh, politics. This is the very thing that since the beginning we have striven not to have a political element in the church. They are doing that very thing right in front of our faces here. They're being as political as you could possibly be, singling out people who have an opinion that's within the range of accepted opinion and saying, you can't speak here. Currently, this is being used to suppress the voices of those who have opposed women's ordination those who have supported the voted position of the world church. And if this new reset of power continues to take hold, I guarantee you this will be used again and again in the future on other new uh, desires and goals that will come up. And, and in order to squeeze the people, conform the people to have this certain thinking, that's, they're going to try to use this very, they'll use this very thing to keep them from hearing one set of ideas and limit them to only hearing this other set of ideas. And once this reset has fully taken hold, the machinery that God has set up it among his people to, to lead people to Jesus and to, to receive present truth, that very same machinery will be flipped over and that will be being used to oppress people and it'll be used to suppress and only allow a certain, a certain viewpoint. This new big brothering of church members and suppression of guest speakers has brought into the open the rapid politicization of the church. And not by conservative zealots, but by progressive new modelers. Naked authoritarianism is now on full display as faithful workers are singled out for suppression. If this new approach takes hold, it will mean that hundreds of unique individualized guidelines will pop up in all these different conferences. And each one will be different. It'll be its own thing. In, in effect, this marks the, the end of any pretense of having a unified church. It's congregationalism, but on the conference level. And this change not only upends the authority of the church, but it's a new tool to bypass checks and balances. Changes desired by certain elements within church administration, which they know that the World Church in General Conference session would never vote to approve. And some of those very changes are happening right now. They're being brought in piecemeal by conferences developing their own their own guidelines, their own policy, their own special unique values, separate from distinct and even in contradiction 
to the World Church values. And accountability to membership is being bypassed while the church suffers. This new change is destabilizing in the extreme. And in effect, it's a self-inflicted attack on the church. It's an attack. It's attacking its own body. It's, it's an attack on its own unity. It's kind of like somewhere the church has picked up some kind of an autoimmune disease and now it's attacking itself. This new wording, as written, obviously lends itself to abuse and is speeding the fragmentation of the church. It is a de facto lockdown against guest speakers who support the voted position of the global church. In conclusion, I want to say this. Authority rests in the membership. And while members anticipate that the presentation of plain error, of course, church leaders and administrators are authorized to, to address that. But the membership has never granted the leadership elements of the church authority to suppress that which falls within the range of acceptable opinion. And I want to make a request right here. I request that the Autumn Council of the General Conference, meeting October 5 through 11 in the year 2023, act to denominationally freeze all development of guest speaker implementations. While the matter can be more carefully studied and the obvious abuses which so immediately have popped out can be corrected. I'm asking for the General Conference to revisit the wording in the church manual on pages 35 and on page 126, to act to preserve the liberty of the local church, to invite guest speakers who are members in regular standing, who sustain the fundamental beliefs of the church, and who support the voted decisions of the church in general conference session. Thank you for considering this request. Hey everybody, next time we're moving on to part seven, we're gonna start talking about constituency meetings. All right, let's try again here.